So I've been asked to come and talk to you um, by the role-based capability team who deliver the track maintenance engineering training course. Um, and they wanted to, you guys to hear from the horse's mouth, so to speak, which is me, the horse. Um, I came up with that title. They didn't call me a horse. Um, so I won't go into like sort of the detail of the course. Basically, it's pretty Roncil and does what it says, track maintenance um, training course, gives you everything you need to know to be a TME. Um, but just so you know, it's made up of uh, five modules each week long and you do it over a year. So I did it in 2021 last year um, and obviously I took over TME in 2020 so I was quite like new to the role and um, so a few of you have probably also been on the course there's a few faces out there I know have and um, so probably a good time for your post-lunch afternoon nap and um, for everyone else and um, pay attention and um, we'll try and keep you absolutely riveted um, and by the end you'll be queuing up to get a place on the course or sign your team up um, and they'll be going like hot cakes um, or Glastonbury tickets right so um, I'm just going to, like I say, I won't go into the detail. I'm going to pick sort of my four main themes or takeaways I took from the course. Um, and the first one I'm going to talk about is time. I just said it's a five-week course spread over a year. Um, and that's a lot of time. None of us ever have enough time. It's the one thing if people say, oh, what would your power be if you're a superhero? I'm like, I'd stop time, like Bernard's watch. Pause time, get everything done you need to do. That's what we're all after. So it's pretty daunting and scary when someone's like, can you take five weeks out of your job? You're thinking, no, I can't take five minutes out of my job. Um, and the interesting thing is this was actually one of the biggest benefits I found. Um, so to take that time away out of the day to day, um, you stop, think, um, reflect, review, um, come up with new ideas um, was sort of invaluable, really, because as TMEs, we're often like, you get really stuck into that day-to-day, -day, don't you? Repetitive, fire over here, fire over there, your little hamster in the run, and you just, you never stop. Um, so took that new perspective, and that a lot has been mentioned this morning about trying to become more proactive with our maintenance, less reactive. Um, and that's what gave me the opportunity to do, to have that perspective. Um, and that's really the theme they were hammering out in the course as well. Um, I mean, that PF curve popped up on the screen every module, like a jack-in-the-box on something. Um, but that repetitiveness also helped because it really sunk into me. So, for example, a few weeks ago, I was going through like a horrendous week, loads of P8 failures on the 053. Um, and I think I took a different approach to it than I would have done when I first took over as TME because I thought, right, contain that risk, deal with the response, did that. But then straight away, I was starting to think, why have we had that peak? What am I going to do to prevent that peak? Um, lubrication, grinding, preventative maintenance, that kind of thing. Um, and we actually had quite a good discussion with Simon on one of my modules about what level of detail we should get involved in for our role. And again, when I first took over TME, I was very much head down, get on with the day job, just don't mess this up. Um, that was my main worry. Um, and now, having gone through all this, I'm thinking, actually, I should be thinking more strategic. Um, how can I be proactive? Um, and what level of the day-to-day -day detail should I get involved in? And the discussion we had about was how that varies from like IMDM right down to operative. And if you micromanage someone and do their job for them, sort of the detriment that can have. Um, so that's kind of the perspective it gave me. Um, so the next one is fill the gaps. Um, so this is sort of about the technical knowledge um, and again, this is probably a misconception that I had before I went on the course, that I thought, oh, I'm a new TME, TME. Um, I'm going on this TME course, um, I'm an engineer, it's an engineering course, it's going to be full, day to day, all this technical detail, there must be all this like secret stuff that TMEs know that I don't know because I'm new and I'm going to learn it all, like a blank page, five weeks worth, and then actually you realise, if you go through the first course and it's sort of about track inspection, you think, I know this, and then it's like, Yes, of course I do. Like, if I didn't know anything about being a TME, um, the IME would have been a bit of an idiot to give me the job, wouldn't he? So, um, you know a bit, and it's about filling those gaps. And those gaps can be really important, because, as we know, we can't let anything slip. Um, and for me, one of the gaps I had was um, the way we're set up, I don't have the RME report to me. So my knowledge of all that aspect of things, um, the welding, grinding, ultrasonics, um, that really helped me, and, and I've used that again, like I said, with some of the um, 053 failures we've been having. Um, and again, I think it's more about, it's just been mentioned, your CPD, your continual professional development. We're always continually learning. 
Um, so no one ever knows it all. Um, and again, we've got to know that you do have knowledge and you're constantly learning. All right. So on the CPD and development part, um, there's support on the course, so they encourage you to do a um, personal development plan, which was mentioned on the previous segment, um, as being required for your professional development, um, and they encourage you to go for your professional registration with the PWI, offer any support for that. Personally, for me, um, I'd done my ING, um, and I had a plan to go for my CNG, but when I took over TME, I kind of sort of dropped it and forgot about it. Um, but I'm uh, back on that chartership train now. Um, I'm moving along. Um, it's going pretty slowly. Um, this is me, I saw I was on, I think. Um, but I'm getting there, So, and that's sort of thanks to the course. It's given me more CPD and a bit of a push to get there and try and get my chartership soon. Um, and again, the sort of personal development it offers you. Um, so if you said to me like two years ago, oh, you'll be standing up there in front of all these people, and I don't know how many people down the lens, I won't think about that, um, I'd have said, Oh, no way. Um, and when I got the call um, to ask to come and help, um, my first reaction, to be honest, was, ah, panic, say no, abort, abort. Um, but then I thought, no, we've done a lot on the TME training course, doing presentations, we've done them every module, a lot of practice, a lot of watching yourself back. Um, and I think it's something I developed in, and I thought, right, okay, I'll, I'll push myself, I'll test myself, I'll try talking to all these people. Um, so at the end of this, you can judge the success of the course on that. Um, if I've tanked it or not. Um, right, next one. So sort of the fourth one, um, last but definitely not least, and probably actually the most valuable, was meeting the other delegates on the course. And we were all pretty much at similar stages in our career. So we'd all either just taken on TME role, or it was ATMEs who were throughout the course, most got appointed to TME roles, which was great to see everyone developing. Um, so you can see our lovely happy gang up there. Um, we had a great group um, and it was great to get together. I think when we split into like regions and routes, I felt it became quite segregated. You didn't have that sort of integration as much. I started TME just as COVID hit. So again, I felt quite isolated, I suppose, because we weren't really getting out to events like this or meeting people. Um, so we started our first few modules were on Teams. And again, that was good just to have that connection, sharing knowledge. Um, it was really fascinating to see that a lot of us, I think you find out on days like today as well, a lot of us have the same problems, um, but also very different areas, um, but you can still learn from that. So um, I'll give Graham a shout out, he's here today. Um, he works on the West Coast Main Line, 125 mile an hour track. Uh, I don't have any of that, so you think, oh, what could I learn from that? Um, but actually how they do ATG, track geometry, how he manages his tamping plan, um, I've learnt so much from that and I'm going to take a lot of that and apply that to my area, or I'd like to, um, because of the track geometry issues I have working on like Pete Fenland, um, there's a lot I can learn from how that ATG is managed. Um, so that's it really. Um, so after those four things, um, basically a lot of thinking, um, filling my knowledge gaps, a bit of personal development and um, stealing some ideas off other people. Um, I was spat out uh, the training machine back to work um, and that's really kind of where the hard work begins to be honest um, and where I'm seeing the benefit or going to see the benefit um, but very little by little because it is hard work um, and it's all right coming away from a training course like that with a list as long as your arm of everything you want to do you've had the ideas you've got the to-do list um, but that's where the side of the course which I wasn't expecting the non-technical stuff the soft skills, the leadership side of it, um, is the sort of gives you the skills or the how to to like now implement them. Um, so to just sum up, really, I think from where I was when I started being TME, like I said, head down, get it done. Now I feel like I have, and my main aim was just don't mess up. My, I've now got, I don't want to use the cheesy tagline, but vision. Um, I now have a sort of vision or goal of what I want to do as TME, how I want to develop, improve, I've got my to-do list, um, and I think the training course has just given me those ideas and then the tools I need to input them. Um, um, so I'm doing that. I wouldn't have that if I hadn't been on the course, is how I feel. Um, and that's it. Um, oh, also, that chip they inserted must be working, right? <laughs> um, so I'll let David explain his experiences now.
Uh, great, thank you. Uh, so, I have got some slides that I'll go through in a minute, but I just wanted to sort of um, go over the incorporated step again. So I'm an incorporated engineer. Um, I applied about 18 months ago. Um, and I, I do feel that this course really helped me. I've not put a slide in, which is why I just wanted to mention it. Because, um, like Sarah said, then part of the course is doing presentations and it's they give you little projects to go away and examine a bit of your infrastructure. So go and look at a critical junction, um, go and look at a particular problem site and come up with a solution for it. And when you go through the incorporated or the chartered process, you have to give examples of when you've done that sort of thing. So by going on the course and keeping track of what you're doing, you're basically doing your incorporated or your chartered application form. So why not get to the end of the course and then put the process through? Um, my dad's an engineer. He's a chemical engineer. He never went for chartered engineer because he's a bit old school. He thought I don't need a bit of paper to prove how good I am. I know I'm a good engineer because my boss always comes to me when he's got a problem. Um, but I think the world's changing these days. I think we really do need to have those, those letters after our name. So this is an ideal way of getting into it. So if, if anybody's not been on the course, um, I think you should really take it up if you get the opportunity and really push to go on it and then follow it through and get your accreditation. Um, okay, so I've sort of flipped this on its head a little bit. Um, so I've spoken about the course. So I've sort of taken my view on it. Um, like we said, I'm relatively new to the railway, so I've only been on since 2017. So five years on the railway, so very inexperienced compared to most people in this room and most people listening. Um, so for me, my experience of what a maintenance engineer does is what your IME expects of you at your VIS meeting on a Friday afternoon. Um, as long as you're keeping them happy, then you're doing a good job. Um, as well as that, there's a, a, a standard called TRK001, and he's got some friends as well. Um, and one of the one of the uh, sort of the running jokes on the course is TME shell. Uh, so Simon started pretty much every lecture by saying, oh, the TME shell, the standard says the TME shell. So your TME job's written down for you. It's in TRK001, all you've got to do is whatever TME shell, just do that. Um, manage it through your PDR, your PGSI, your self-assurance process, and that's it, job done. Um, but then as Sarah said, it's being a track maintenance engineer is taking it to the next step and yeah doing your fundamentals getting your basics right but then taking it to the next step looking at the higher level and realizing what you're doing why you're doing it and when you've got a problem how you're going to fix it and um, so what i'd like to do is sort of uh, challenge any tmes in the room challenge any budding tmes in the room challenge any imes who are listening any section managers who want to be a tme um, and say have you got these things we've seen a lot of technology today this morning a lot of um, remote monitoring, intelligent infrastructure. But if we go back to basics, have we got our, our, our basic track maintenance engineering plan right? Um, so these are the questions that I, I'd ask myself. At the moment, I'm doing a, an SM job. Um, but if I do get a CME job, these are the questions that I'll be asking myself and my SM. So have I got a business plan? Do I know what my volumes are? Are they realistic? Um, have I got the right resources that I need? And have I got it written down somewhere? Have I got an inspection and maintenance manual? Have I got a risk register? Or am I just winging it? If somebody says to me, what's your inspection regime? Do I know? Yeah, I know it in my head, but can I say to whoever's asking me, this is what it is. This is how I inspect my tracks. This is how I assure myself that it's being inspected. Um, so some of the things you go through on the course is the track recording plan, ensuring compliance with time scales. I'm not going to read every line. You can read it. Um, but a big one is competence profiles as well, especially um, as we move towards RBM and we're not looking at stuff as often or we're looking at stuff using technology or photographs. Have we got competent people looking at it, not just somebody who's relatively new to the team and we're giving them some photographs and saying, just that look all right. Uh, we need to make sure that the people who work for us are competent to do what we want them to do. Uh, once we've inspected stuff and we look at production, um, we need to ask ourselves, is maintenance required? Do we actually have to do maintenance? Are we just doing it for the sake of it? Are we doing it because the standard tells us to? Are we doing it because somebody else asked us to, because someone's thrown some money at us? Uh, do we need to do it? Is it the right thing to do? And then again, are we doing it properly? Are we doing scoping visits? Um, have we got TVs? If we haven't, are we using the correct plants, tools, processes in the right, in the right time scales? Um, are we optimising our access? Access is, is really hard to come by these days. So when we do get it, are we using it properly? 
Another thing we go through on the course is seasonal prep. So cold weather, hot weather, extreme weather. Do we know our risk sites? Can we name them? Have we got a plan for them? Again, it's an SM, yep. I know exactly where my risk sites are. But then as a TME, you know where your risk sites are, but you also need to know what your plan is. So have you got a plan that's not just put a pump in and pump the water away? Or that's not send the watchman to make sure it looks all right? What, what's your plan to deal with it? As an engineer, take the next step and come up with an actual plan. Work with the people, work with your peers, work with your principal your engineers to come up with a plan. Look at how much money you get. You can't fix all the problems, but choose the ones that you can fix and then come up with a proper plan and work through them properly. Uh, again, rail reprofiling. So like Sarah said, uh, we're not all directly related to RMEs or the RME team, but we should be talking to them regularly. We should know what the grinding plan is. We should know why we're sending grinding trains or milling trains where we are doing. We should know when they're there so that we know what they're doing and what we can expect to see when they've been. Obvious things like make sure pre-76 isn't part of the plan. Um, and then look at, again, like I said, looking at cost fee benefits and make sure that we're not just sending the stuff there because someone said, oh, there's a train here, where do you want it? Well, I don't really want it, but send it over there. If you don't want it and you don't need it, send it to somebody who can. Um, defect management, again, just record keeping. Make sure that you know what defects you've got. You know you've got a plan for them. Uh, make sure that they're being removed efficiently and economically. So don't just go and do head repair welds. If you've got three miles worth of pre-76 rail, try and get it done properly. Um, again, touching on friction management, so make sure you know where your problem sites are. Make sure you know what your lubrication regime is. Make sure the people who go look at it know what to do when they see the lubrication is not working. Um, again, we touched on it before, but if you've got a new, a new site or a site that's changed recently, you might need to review your lubrication programme and make sure that it's still relevant and it's still up to date. Um, so in summary, um, what I got from the course and is try and know the difference between best practice and what's actually achievable. Um, like I say, TOK T -O -K 001 will tell you exactly what to do and when to do it, but is that the best thing to do? Is it realistic? Um, and can you physically do it? And then on the back of that, like we spoke about, you can build your long-term strategy, so that looks at reliability. If you've got any key junctions, have you got a plan? So that they're resilient, they perform well work together with other teams. Uh, track worker safety is a big one. Um, so obviously we have the RR improvement notice. Um, touched upon this briefly with the, the SNC measuring train. Um, it, it's good. It's good that we can we can look at stuff remotely. Uh, we need to make sure that we cover all bases, but that's exactly the way that we need to be going so that we can get people off the track and into the office and just go out when we actually have to. And when we do go out, we're doing proper work, work that makes a difference. Um, and this is my final slide, it's a bit of a, so you go on the course and you think, oh yeah, actually I've had a rethink, um, I need to go away and come up with a strategy and a, and a plan for all my problem sites, but then you get back to the office and it's a bit of Instagram versus reality. So yeah, we've got a list, TRK001 says TME shelf, this is how you do it, this is when. Um, but then you'll go to your VIS meeting on a Friday, or whenever your VIS meeting is, and your IME will want to know why you're overspent why you've got so many staff on sick, why you've got so many staff whose competences have expired, why you've got a service, selecting, service affecting failure. And on the back of that, you can also be the first responder if you've got an incident. Not always, but you might have to go out. Um, you've also got an off-track section to manage. You've also got an RTNL section to manage, a welding section to manage. Um, and at the bottom of that, you're an engineer who's trying to do the best thing in the world of engineering. Um, so two takeaways for me. First is there's no right answer. There's lots of different things you can look at to help you make the right choice. There's lots of different people you can speak to. Um, but as long as you make a choice, you believe in the choice that you've made and you know why you've made it and you can justify it, then that should be your answer and you should be prepared to stick to it. Um, and then secondly, it's just it's really important to have a good team. Obviously as a TME, you might inherit some people, um, but there's nothing wrong with you managing them or recruiting new people and being involved in the recruitment process because a lot of what you do as a TME relies on other people. You delegate a lot of work, you delegate a lot of authority to people and you have to make sure that they're doing what they should be doing and you have to make sure that they're doing what you should be doing. So it really is important to have a good team around you as well. 
Uh, that's it for me. Thank you. All right, good afternoon. Uh, so thank you to Sarah and David for taking the time and being willing volunteers to, uh, to come along today. Um, so well, what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk a little bit about what are their offerings. Okay, so mentioned the Track Maintenance Engineer programme there, but the, we have got other offerings at the moment. Okay, so we're quite a long way through the, rail, um, the, the, the TME journey, so we're at cohort 13. We're currently planning cohorts 14 and 15 to start this year. Um, skipping down to rail management engineer, we started the pilot for that uh, back in June, in, seems like a lifetime ago, back in May, and we've got the second event running in, uh, in July for that, and we've picked up some good contacts today that volunteered to come along and give us a bit more of a deeper industry in insight into rail management and what's happening there as well. Um, but a great, great success story as well is we've gone from the professional roles and we're starting to talk about the broader maintenance community for track. Uh, so we're, we're starting the pilot for the technical office programme next week. So although, yes, we've got strikes going on, but we're committed to running it. And uh, the, the majority of delegates have committed to come along as well, which, you know, for anyone who's supporting that programme, thank you very much for making sure they come along. Um, some, some other great news for the technical officer as well is think about professional registration. Um, we're aiming to take the, the delegates through the journey to EngTech registration during their programme. Uh, so if they've got the prerequisite industrial experience, they'll be supported, they'll be mentored. So they should come out of that program, um, all signed up, professionally registered to start their journey, which I think is fantastic news. And thank you to, uh, to Brian and Kate for the PBY for supporting that. Right, IME and IMDM, do they know stuff? Who knows, okay? <laughs> right, so we're, we're aiming to give them bit of a more of an insight into the infrastructure but also what's their job uh, what's their what's the behavior expected so the slide there just represents the whole program but specifically thinking about track is these are the topics we're going to be covering okay it's it's only two days okay we're not going to turn uh, an EMP maintenance engineers move to an IME role into a track engineer in two days but what we are going to do is give them an insight into the risks and how the how the risk are managed by the track engineering community, okay? But also, looking at the, uh, the bottom two blobs in orange, what are, what are their accountabilities in terms of track engineering? Uh, but importantly, how can they support you in your role? Uh, and what's the behavior they need to do uh, to have in place? And as sort of mentioned by Sarah and David there, it's all about that proactive, it's about proactive maintenance, it's about proactive attitude and how can they take that, those key messages to support you better. I've, I've been flashed my timing, so I'm gonna move on. So what does it all mean? Okay, so how do you book on a course? Is it worth booking onto a course? I'll let you make the judgment if it's worth it or not. Uh, have a chat with Sarah, have a chat with David, have a chat with other people that have been through the program. If anybody wants to give me a call, uh, I'm more than happy to chat through the program, the specifics of it. D d um, give me a call. Um, simon.day, networrail.co.uk, or send a message to the team, okay? Um, but we do only base demand uh, and delivery of the programmes on agreed funded demand. So if someone comes to me next week to go, oh, when's your know next course, can I get on it? As part of the business planning cycle with your route training support managers, that's there to identify that demand. That means then we can scale up the delivery to go, how many, how many cohorts or how many modules are we gonna deliver over that year? Okay. We also send the message out, got a couple of faces in the audience uh, that actually support the delivery as well. So we get people to either come along for the whole week, come along for a day, or, or join uh, Q&A panels in, in the afternoon to talk through specifics with the delegates. Okay, so I'll be going out to the community to practice to say, you know, how would each community of practice like to get involved in the respective programmes to give sort of the, key, the key messages from that community of practice, what's changing and, and how's technology being adopted and how can we support that change. Okay. Um, I think that's it. That is it, apart from, uh, I think, one thank you. Um, this, the development of role-based capability in all the programmes started many years ago. There's a, a couple of investigations that sort of kicked off and got the funding, but somebody who's been key through all that journey is Scott Saxelby, who uh, is leaving very soon. Um, I think without the initial successes of the work Scott did with some of the learning designers, I don't think we'd be where we are now with all these track programmes. So I think a thank you to Scott on my behalf and everyone who's been, everyone who's been through the programme, because it wouldn't be possible without Scott.
So thank you.